Julius Caesar was elected to the post of Roman consul, gaining great authority in all the territories conquered by Rome. But to achieve such an important position, Julius Caesar needed to incur a gigantic debt to Marcus Crassus, the richest man in Rome. Caesar had not yet forgotten that day at the foot of the statue of Alexander the Great. The desire to match Alexander in his conquests was still alive in Julius Caesar's heart. The best way to achieve his goals was to conquer new territories for Rome, thus confiscating the riches and receiving part of the taxes of the conquered cities and villages. It was there that Julius Caesar focused his attention on Gaul. Gaul was an ancient region, classified by the Romans, comprising territories where France, Belgium, and part of Italy and Germany are located today. For the most part, Gaul was a wild territory, full of forests and inhabited by several very hostile Celtic tribes. With these obstacles, Gaul was not easy to invade, much less to conquer. Because it was a difficult task, Julius Caesar made Gaul the main target of his ambitions. In April 58 BC, Caesar marched towards Gaul in command of four legions, some 24,000 soldiers. Julius knew he could not simply enter the Gaul territories. It was necessary to plan his actions carefully, otherwise he would lose everything for which he fought so long to conquer. Despite its apparent military strength, Gaul was divided into several kingdoms, which were constantly fighting each other. These kingdoms were commanded by tribal chiefs or self-proclaimed kings. They often declared wars to conquer new agricultural lands or to avenge old blood feuds between tribes. Taking advantage of this instability, Julius Caesar sent emissaries to talk with the leaders of the different tribes, seeking to establish political and military alliances. In his letters, Julius offered the military support of his legions in exchange for permission to enter Gaul territory and food provisions for his soldiers. The first alliances were quickly formed, and Caesar finally entered Gaul. The first conflict between Caesar's legions and the Gauls took place at the Battle of Bibracte, where the Romans found a far greater number of enemies. The Gauls were part of the Helvetians tribe, who were migrating in Gaul, attacking other tribes and leaving a trail of destruction. Julius Caesar organized part of his legions on top of a hill, gaining a strategic position against the Gauls. The other parts of the legions were hidden on another hill, covered by trees. The Roman legions managed to stop the Gauls' initial advance. It was the start of a long and arduous struggle that would last almost a whole day. At the ideal moment, Julius ordered the hidden legions to attack the rear of the Gaul army. The Gauls resisted for some time, but the discipline and determination of the Roman legions defeated the numerical advantage of their enemies. The Helvetians surrendered. Julius allowed many to be freed, provided they returned to their lands and agreed to work the crops to feed the legions. Others were not so lucky. They were sent as prisoners to Rome, where they would be sold as slaves. This heroic victory marked the beginning of several conquests in Gaul. Soon after, Caesar and his legions fought the Germanic tribe of the Suevi and achieved another major victory. In the years that followed, Julius Caesar continued to advance in Gaul territory, establishing new alliances, subduing tribes, or, when necessary, destroying cities and settlements. Obviously, the Gauls did not peacefully accept the Roman occupation, at times, some tribes rebelled, which provoked new battles. After suffocating a rebellion by the Belgian tribe in 55 BC, Gaul had been almost completely conquered by Julius Caesar. Caesar had accumulated enough wealth to pay his debt to Crassus, and after that, he would have enough to live in peace. His term as consul was also nearing its end. After that, he would have to return to Rome. But that year, one of his legions in northern Gaul sighted a strange island on the horizon. That island was Britain. Caesar had already read about the existence of that island in ancient Greek manuscripts. Upon learning of its location, he again felt the ambition and desire to reach where no other Roman had been. To cross the sea and reach Great Britain, Julius Caesar needed two things, boats to transport the soldiers and time. Caesar ordered the construction of some boats whose completion would take many months. Impatient with the slow progress and the construction of the boats, Caesar decided to take a risk. 
only part of his legions would cross the sea to build a fortified camp. But he did not anticipate the disaster that eventually occurred, for that region is often affected by storms. During the crossing, a strong storm pushed the Roman ships against the cliff rocks. The few survivors who reached the beach were surprised by the Breton war chariots and retreated to their boats. This defeat did not affect Julius Caesar's resolve, but it took him a long time to get the necessary votes. In 54 BC, Julius Caesar finally arrived in Great Britain, where he initially set up a fortified camp near the beach. The Bretons did not peacefully accept the Roman occupation. Caesar spent over a year in Britain, warring and subduing the numerous tribes of that territory. This new conquest further enhanced Julius Caesar's reputation. The people in the city of Rome extolled his accomplishments, which concerned even more some members of the Roman Senate. During the time Julius Caesar spent in Brittany, new problems began to arise in Gaul. Tribal leaders asked their warriors to gather and expel the Romans from Gaul. Caesar knew this threat was serious. If Gaul united under a single flag, it would be virtually impossible to recover the conquered territories. One of those insurgent leaders was the famous Vercingetorix, prince of the Arvinus tribe. Vercingetorix was able to bring together many tribal chiefs and warriors under his command to attack the Roman garrisons in Gaul. When Caesar returned to Gaul, Vercingetorix was forced to retreat to avoid a direct confrontation with the Roman legions. In his escape through Gaul territory, Vercingetorix's troops destroyed everything in their path, burning villages and plantations to leave no food for the Romans. The strategy was working. The situation of Caesar's legions was not positive. Soldiers began to succumb due to hunger and effort caused by the long march. Julius Caesar again used his persuasion and began to intimidate and bribe the tribal chiefs who were not yet allies of Vercingetorix. Caesar managed to confiscate precious provisions to feed his soldiers and continue the pursuit of Vercingetorix. Some battles were fought along the way, and Julius Caesar proved his worth again by getting off his horse and joining his soldiers in the vanguard of the most chaotic battles. The legionaries felt an enormous pride and admiration for the general. Many fought to the end to defend Caesar's life and dreams. Finally, Vercingetorix was forced to retreat to the city of Alesia, built on top of a hill and a good place of defense against the Roman legions. The siege of Alesia was one of the most famous in history. Julius Caesar and Vercingetorix needed to make the most of their skills as commanders. Caesar surrounded the city of Alesia. He knew that if he tried to force his way into the city, it would cost the lives of many of his legionnaires. The other alternative was to force those inside the city to starve and thirst, forcing them to surrender. But Caesar did not have much time. He was aware of the approach of a Gaul army, whose mission was to rescue the inhabitants of Alesia. If this Gaul army arrived in time, Julius Caesar and his legions were surrounded by two enemy forces and would have no chance of victory. The solution was to build two wooden walls around the city. One would keep the inhabitants of the city trapped inside. The other would be able to contain the approaching army. The strategy was successful. When the Gaul army arrived, the Roman legions showed their worth again, defeating a far greater number of enemies. After witnessing this great victory, Vercingetorix surrendered to Julius Caesar. On a historic day, Vercingetorix proudly put on his armor and rode alone to the Roman camp. He stood face to face with Julius Caesar and without saying a word, threw down his arms in a sign of Gaul's surrender. With the conquest of Gaul, Caesar achieved everything he had always desired. His name was admired and feared among the Romans. His wealth was vast. He felt ready to return triumphantly to the city of Rome.